uh, turn to Psalm 18 together tonight. Um, I, I don't want to do a whole lot of, of preaching. We're going to read a lot. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on. Psalm 18 is actually the third longest psalm in the Psalter. We know Psalm 119 is the longest, but uh, it's a lengthy psalm. There's 50 verses, and we may look at each one, but I don't want to dig too deep. I do want to say this. The 18th psalm has been a tremendous help, uh, both in my life and in ministry over the years. In fact, if you've been uh, in the hospital or you've been going through a difficult time, it's possible that I have shared with you Psalm 18 at some point. Uh, because it's been such a great encouragement to my own heart. And, and, and I want to share that with others as I go and I, I visit. Uh, I always like to share the word, and, and, and this 18th Psalm has been a great help uh, to the hearts of my brothers and sisters in Christ over the years. And so I wanted to share it with you tonight. And, and not again, I don't want to dig too deep. It, it speaks for itself, so we're going to look at it together, and I'll, uh, I'll try and introduce it, at least so you know what's going on. Uh, Remember, uh, when we look at the Psalms, these titles that we have are part of the inspired scripture, right? So we have not only a lengthy Psalm, but we have a lengthy title when you look at Psalm 18. There's only one other Psalm in the whole, um, in the whole book that has a longer title than, than the 18th Psalm. But we see it here, to the choir master, a Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul, he said. So we know the source of the psalm. We know that David is the one who wrote it. And we know the events that kind of surround, at least we know what inspired the psalm. Right. So this has to do with um, David's Salvation, deliverance, protection from his enemy, particularly, <coughs> particularly King <coughs> Saul. Excuse me. <coughs> we'll see if we can get going here. <laughs> um, we do know this. Uh, Psalm or Second uh, Samuel chapter twenty-two is almost <coughs> an exact word for word uh, of what we'll read here in Psalm eighteen. And David penned Psalm twenty-two towards the end of his life. So this is a time where David is looking back, far back. Remember, this time that he dealt with Saul was in his younger years, right? As a teenager, David was anointed to be king over Israel, but he did not become king at that time. There was a king, right, Saul. And David, he loved Saul. He served Saul. (coughs) Uh, He served in his court. He was best friends with his son, Jonathan. But Saul, (laughs) Saul hated David, right? He knew that David was going to be the next king, and he despised him for it. And he tried to hunt him down, and we, we have many a different accounts in David's life of hiding out in caves and, and running, you know, and, and, and so we, we have this, this picture of David's life where he's on the run for over a decade, hiding from this king who he loves and he serves and he recognizes as God's anointed. And yet Saul wants him dead because he wants to protect his throne for his family. Right, so this is the background behind this. And what we know is, is David comes to a point in his life where his, this, this persecution is so severe that he feels like he has no hope. Look at verses 4 and 5. Verse 4 says, The cords of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of shoal entangled me. The snares of death confronted me David basically says what the end is close right I'm I'm not going to make it out of this and there are so many times where David was cornered and it seemed like there was no hope there was just so David has a huge problem right the most powerful man in the nation is hunting him down and he has his army chasing him down and many times we find David it just seems like there's no way out and God will miraculously 
deliver him, rescue him time and time again. And it's, it's just a good reminder to us tonight that you know, there are times where we face challenges, where we face trials, where we face very real problems, sometimes even life-threatening problems. And in those moments, God is at work. And, and we don't want to forget that, right? We want to remember that God is at work. And David here, as he remembers the challenge that he faced and, and that this near-death encounter time and time again with King Saul, he just remembers how it all played out. Right? So this problem led him to cry out to the Lord. You see in verse 3, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Verse 6, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I cried for help. From his temple, he heard my voice and my cry to him reached his ears. That's good news, isn't it? David's in trouble. He has a, a major problem. And he, he does what we should do when we're in trouble and we have problems. He prays. He cries out to the Lord. And the Lord hears his prayer. He hears it. And he answers. And we begin to see how this unfolds. What we're going to see happen here is out of this trial comes praise. Right? Comes worship. Comes adoration and that's what we want right god is worthy of our worship even when we even when we face trials and troubles and problems god is worthy to be praised and we're going to see how this flows out and how it works out so from david's prayer as god moves to help there's several things i want to pull out here tonight so we're going to read them again i'm not going to point out a whole lot but starting in verse 16 we see god's protection David's life is on the line, and he says this, He sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me. Because he delighted in me. Now that's, that's sweet, isn't it? Right? We, we, we see here, that David remembers how dire the situation was. And he says, the Lord brought me out. He rescued me. He protected me. Why didn't he do it? Because he delighted in me. Yeah, we see God's affection for his people. Yeah, that... That should be an encouragement to you. I don't know if you stop to think about that. I don't, some, sometimes I have a hard time with the way in which I think about God. I, I, like to, I, 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 have a, I don't have a hard time thinking about God as, as king and as Lord. You know, he is sovereign over all things. But I do have a difficult time thinking about God as delighting in me. But that's exactly what he says. He delighted in me. I am his. He chose me. He saved me. He rescued me. Brothers and sisters, as, as those who Jesus died for, as those who God gave, you know, how shall he not give us all things? Right? I mean, we are the object of his affection and his delight. And, and this is what David is remembering. Right? Because God loved me, he, he saved me. He rescued me. He delights in me. He protected him. Right? And then we see how he did it. Right? David's thinking back on how this all unfolded. And we have some poetic language here and some allusions back to some prior accounts. But in verse 7, I know I'm jumping around. Just bear with me. Right? We read this. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations also of the mountains trembled and quaked because he was angry. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He came swiftly on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. Thick clouds, dark with water. Out of the brightness before him, hailstones and coals of fire broke through his clouds. 
the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered His voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And He sent out His arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke. O Lord, at the blast of the breath of your nostrils. Now, again, this is poetic language here. And David's thinking back. He's thinking back not to exactly what God did to deliver him from Saul, but how God delivered the nation. So this language should sound really familiar to what we've been looking at on Exodus on Wednesday nights. Right? That first portion there sounds an awful lot like what happened on Mount Sinai, does it not? As the smoke enveloped the mountain and God just thundered and lightning and there was great... But what was that a picture of? It was a picture of God's presence. And that's what David wants to portray here. How did God rescue? How did he save? How did he deliver me? He showed up, right? And, and you know, then he alludes back to the parting of the Red Sea here and how God with his nostrils just laid the ground bare, how God delivered. He led them across by a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. God was with his people. And so David here, in this way, is saying, in my distress, in my trial, God was there. He was there. And brothers and sisters, God never leaves you. He never forsakes you. Right? He said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Now, this is a promise for his people. And we'll see, this is very personal, right? The, the promises and the protection that we see in Psalm 18, it, it only belongs to those who have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Right? But it's a powerful promise and a powerful presence. And then we see down in verse 25, we see God's power on display. David understands this. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord my God lightens my darkness. For by you, I can run against a troop. And by my God... I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. Now I want to stop there just for a moment. Because verse 30, just tell, right, David, David is God's anointed. Right? David is the one, David is God's choice servant. He has been faithful to serve him. When, at, when the entire nation failed to trust God, David trusted him, right, faced the giant Goliath, God, he, he put his trust in God. And now we see he's in, the, he's in a mess. The king wants him dead. And you, we look at that, we think, God, what are you doing? David served you faithfully. He never failed you. He didn't let you down. And you've got him here running for his life from Saul. What, what are you doing? And sometimes we see we see circumstances come into our life and we think, God, I don't understand what you're doing here. I don't, why would you do this? Why would you allow this to happen? We can read this and we can think that. But David says what? His way is perfect. David doesn't look at this circumstance and think, God, this isn't right. He says what? Your way is perfect. And, and so as this unfolds, God is doing something big in David's heart. Right? He's... He's transforming it. He's changing it. And David's going to come to a place where what we read at the end in Psalm 49, what? He wants everyone to know his God. Now, again, we see God's power on display. So let's continue in verse 31. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer, and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them, and did not turn back till they were consumed. 
I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. And those who hated me, I destroyed. They cried for help, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. As soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. Now, that's a long section to read, I know. But we see God's power and his provision on display for his servant. Right? <laughs> David simply says what? God, you equipped me. You strengthened me. You made me. Right? I mean, there's, there's, that's powerful imagery back there in verse 29. By you, I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. Yeah, what, what's, what's David saying here? It's, it's only in your strength and in your power that I am able to do this. Right? I had no hope over my enemy without your help. But you equipped me. You strengthened me. These images are so, you made my feet like the deer and set me secure on the heights. You would not let me fall. You, would not, you ever watched a deer? You, 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 you're kind of running through the woods or climbing up the hill, and you think, how'd they do that? <laughs> I would have been all over the place. And they're just graceful and quick and fast, and their feet never fall. And David says, my feet were like that. Right? They did not slip. God, you equipped me. Now, brothers and sisters, this is what he does for us. Right? In the midst of the trial, in the midst of the trouble, in the midst of the storm, he strengthens us, and, and he gives us what we need when we need it. Right? So, so we can be strong in the Lord, and we rely on the means that he has given us to fight the battle. You say, well, what, are, what, what does he give us? Well, he gives us his word. He gives us his prayer. He gives us his spirit. <laughs> Some of this language here, Man, it, it, it likens itself to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we have the armor of God, right? The shield and the sword and the helmet. And we see that language jumping off the page here. God has given us what we need for what we're facing. I, I, was, I, I know I've used this quote many times. Hudson Taylor said, God's... <laughs> uh, now I can't come up with it in my head, right? God's work done God's way, will never lack God's supply. Right? That, that's so important, right? God has equipped you to face whatever he places in your path as you, as you rely on trust in him. Right? So we got God's power, God's provision. And so this leads him to praise. God has delivered them. He's rescued them. And so we come back to verse 1, and he says... I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Lord, I love you. This is the only right response to God's salvation, is it not? David experienced deliverance. Brothers and sisters, we have experienced God's salvation in Christ, delivered from sin, Satan, and death. And the right response to that is what? I love you, Lord. I love you. And David does something really fascinating to me. He just pulls all this imagery here. Almost every image you'll see in the Psalms and in the Scriptures, he puts it all together right here. Lord, my protection is in you. You are my shield. You are my rock. You are my strength. You are my deliverer. It's in you that I take refuge. Can there be any doubt? David says, I was in trouble. God saved me. He's my rock. And guess what? He can be your rock too. He can be your help. Right? This just moves him to worship and praise. Look down at verse 46. He begins and he ends the passage in this way. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock. And exalted be the God of my salvation. 
the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. The living God is my rock. He is my fortress. He is the one who rescued me. Now, we see out of, out of that salvation comes praise and worship. And this is what should be true of us, is it not? As we contemplate, and this is what David's doing, he's thinking back, right? He's in his later years. We know that from 2 Samuel 22. He's thinking back on what God has done many years before. And he's remembering how God saved and how God rescued. And as he contemplates that, his heart is moved to worship. Now, that's something we should be able to do as his children at any time, right? Think back on what God has done. Think back on how he saved, how he rescued you. You couldn't do that on your own. We needed him. Desperately we needed him. And we only got a few minutes here, but as David contemplates this, he remembers the promise of God. He's not only thinking back, but he's also thinking ahead as we finish out our passage here in verse 49. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. So now, David's heart and his mind goes to God's promise, and he's thinking not only back, but he's thinking, see, this Psalm 18 is is greater than David. It's pointing to someone who's bigger than David. (laughs) And, And it's important we see that here. As David says, to his offspring forever, he's remembering a promise that God made in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Right. There's going to be one of your offspring who's going to sit on the throne forever and ever and ever. Right. That promise, right, it, it points forward to Christ. Right. Jesus is the greater David. And this psalm here points us forward to that. How, are the, how is his name going to be sung among the nations? This is going to be fulfilled in Christ, right? With those from every tongue and every tribe and every nation gathered around his throne Worshiping the lamb who was slain. Everything we see here in Psalm 18, it, 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 it points to David's deliverance and salvation. But if you look at it, and we don't have time to do that tonight. But if you look at it and read it in light of Christ, you'll see this image pointing you forward to, to what Jesus did. How he was delivered from death over his enemies. How God rescued his anointed one. In fact, If you look back at at verse 20, we see this language. And if we read it in light of David, we think, who does he think he is? I know David. I know what he did. But verse 20 says, the Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he rewarded me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me and his statutes I did not put away from me. I was blameless before him. And I kept myself from guilt. So the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Now I know David is a man after God's own heart, but we also know that he messed up big time. Right? We, we know that, right? He, he sinned with Bathsheba, he killed Uriah, he lied about it, he covered it up. We, 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 we read that and we think, really David? You were blameless? You kept all his rules? I don't think so. But in light of what we know about Psalm 18 and who it points to, this makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? He who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, became sin for us, right? So he was blameless. He did not depart from the ways of God. He kept all of his rules. Jesus did what you and I could never do. And it's in that way that he delivered and he rescued and he saved us. Beautiful, powerful psalm. If you're here tonight and you're struggling, 
uh, there's some there's some problems, there's some trials, there's some difficulties. Just run to those first few verses. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge. Where do you run to in your time of trouble? Where could I go but to the Lord, right? That's the answer. Let's close in prayer.